What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I have the pleasure of having welcoming back Jack Schwager on the podcast. And those uh, that were in episode, we're in like the 280s now, but Jack came uh, on on episode number 26 when I was trading out of trade space in San Juan, Puerto Rico, when the podcast was newer. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it was an incredible experience then, and it's about to be an incredible experience now. We have the legendary author. I'm a fan of all his books. He's done the Market Wizard series. Um, he has a little book of Market Wizards, the Unknown Market Wizards, the Hedge Fund Market Wizards, uh, a futures book, um, and many others he can talk about. So how are you doing, Jack? Welcome back on the podcast. Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks. Awesome. So Jack, uh, okay, so what have you been up to uh, the past couple of years? So, so the thing is, so 2020, I think, is when you released the Unknown Market Wizards. So that was like in the middle of the COVID the pandemic. So what have you been up to since then? And uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in my 70s, by the way. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm thinking, when I said take it easy, you know, I'm, I kayak every day almost and stuff like that. So I haven't been working per se. Um, and I do some stuff on the side. I've got an involvement with Fun Cedar, which is a startup, but that's basically established. And I'm, you know, my my day my day in day out work is is not there for that, just radically as needed. So um, you know, I'm pretty much uh, I'm not quite fully retired, but I'm semi retired. You know. Awesome. Um. And okay, so the unknown market wizards. So what prompted you to write that book? Uh, because it, it's very different from the previous. In the previous, you've done the market wizards, which was um, mostly, I think, institutional, and then the hedge fund market wizards, which is all all institutional. So, what prompted yeah. you to do the unknown market wizards? Well, actually, hedge fund market wizards in part because it was the opposite of that. So, you know, hedge fund market wizards, I was interviewing just you know, as the name implies, you know, established hedge funds, typically managing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, and in this case, I was, uh, you know, looking for people who had had spectacular success, but were literally completely unknown. I mean, the proverbial guy in his bedroom trading, you know, that type of thing. And uh, so that's, so, was, so one, one part of it was to be the opposite of the other one. And the other part was I had begun involvement with this, uh, for, you know, startup called Fun Seater, which was, which is a platform for traders, which gives them performance charts and statistics and stuff like that. And the, uh, that stuff is for free. It's a technology company, but the the investment company is the whole point of it. And that is to find traders and then to utilize the, utilize those traders in in investment products. And I mean that was the long term game plan. So uh, through Funds Eater, actually, I didn't cover a number of the traders that ended up in the book. So it was a combination of those two things. It was one having this focus on the company, which was looking for unknown talent. And the second part was to do the opposite of the previous book. Great. So Fun Cedar, from my understanding, I signed up for it a while back. I haven't followed up with it, though, because it was having trouble syncing my account at the time. So it's yeah. it's uh, to verify the trades and the track record so that there's potential whoever wants to invest or someone that has capital or wants to invest in a strategy can do so. And anybody can show their results uh, to attract that. Is that correct? Yeah, not exactly. Yeah, yes and no. Um, it's not intended. It's not compliant. It's not. It's basically statistically uh, statistically correct, but it's not CFTC compliant. Uh, so it's not designed to be used as a as a source of uh, of um, a record that that meets the legal guidelines. It's intended basically to. Uh, for traders themselves and for us to know, hey, you know, this these results are not coming from the trader. They're coming through the broker, you know. So we when we see these results, and some of these results are kind of sometimes hard to believe, but you know they're coming through the broker, so they, that makes them believable. And so the, that's the purpose of it, uh, the confirmation. And, and also, if it's coming from the broker, then the trader doesn't have to do anything. It gets updated every day automatically. It, you know, there is a, for brokers who are not compatible with Funcedar, there is a, um, uh, an option to to download 
our, our spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, which allows you to upload your data. But if you do that, it's not it's not verified. And secondly, if you have to update it manually whenever you want to bring it up to date. So it's if you it's easier if you have a linkable broker and do it that way. Gotcha. And uh so what prompted you to do this, uh, to, to be part of this? Because like, for example, what comes to my mind is recently the past, especially the past three to five years, there's been an exponential um, inclusion of like retail traders in the market. It's been like, so like to find out the results of these retail traders or to verify their performance, their success. A lot of people have success. I've had some success, a lot of success. Uh, to verify, is that what you, you saw that as a, as a, a need uh, in the market, you know, because like in the institutional side, uh, you can, that's, that's almost public information. Well, first of all, it wasn't, to be fair, it wasn't my idea. It was um, uh, my partner, Emmanuel Bellari, who, who's the CEO, and who's, it was his, his idea and it's his company. Um, but the, 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 the idea made sense because there are a lot of traders. Traders have uh, unknown traders have no way of attracting any money, any investment money. You know, just no, no matter how good they are. You know, I mean, nobody's going to invest with a guy you know who's a who's an ex bellhop in, in Czechoslovakia, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. No matter how good his numbers are, and they're not going to believe the numbers. So, this was a way of tapping into a. Uh, a global market which is just unused and has no option. It was a way of dem democratizing the whole investment process. And the idea was to take a lot of these traders and put them into fund. We actually did launch, we did launch a fund uh, only a few months ago. So our first fund did get started. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the first step in the process of trying to prove the thesis, you know. Awesome. Okay, so you mentioned the uh... The bellhop from Czechoslovakia, and uh, before the podcast started, I briefly we, we talked about Jeffrey Newman, and we also talked about Jeffrey Newman in the last podcast. Um, how he was able, he mentioned in the unknown market wizards growing a sub five thousand dollar account, and I think now he's somewhere, God knows how much he's made, hundreds of millions. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so you found out about these traders through Fund Cedar, and yeah, so. Some of them, some of them. Yeah. What's your take on them now? Like, so can you go over, actually, can you go over uh, the, the Bellhop's uh, story real quick? So he started like with a small amount and, and yeah, where's he at now? Do you have any updates? So actually, you know, uh, he, all through the years, he always traded a small amount because he was literally living off his, his, his earnings. So, you know, he'd have a $50,000 account and he'd make $50,000 whatever, or 40, whatever, and he'd use it to live, so he'd still had a $50,000 account. So his account never grew much. I mean, it vacillated between about 50 and 100, but he was just living off the money. So he never really grew that. He just was earning a living as a trader. Um, but he was generating it with very good numbers. And by good numbers, I mean, his his returns were very good relative to his risk. His, he never had any significant you know, drawdowns. He, his drawdowns were always very controlled. So, um, and, but but since the book, he's actually began managing money, you know, and uh, so he started that process. And now he has to kind of adapt to kind of handling larger sums of money. Uh, but that's where he's at. And um, so, so the last podcast we did, we touched on systematic versus discretionary traders and how the market wizards in, in general uh, you're looking for dramatic performance and that they're mostly discretionary. Now, um, I, what's his name? I think uh, the guy from Czechoslovakia, his name is Pavel, I think. Pavel, yeah. Pavel, Pavel. Yeah, so was he systematic or discretionary or how was well, he, he going? Was, he was discretionary. So he had his, uh, and, you know, clear to the street, so listeners know what, we're, what his approach is, what, he's, what we're talking about. He literally um, only he day trades, uh, you know, which is kind of ironic because that's one of the hardest ways to actually get consistent returns because your commissions are high relative. I shouldn't say commissions. Your your cost of trade, which is mostly slippage, is high relative to to you know what you can earn. 
but he only day trades and he only day trades on earnings reports and he only day trades on earning reports from large you know very or very liquid companies so he, you know that's his very restricted strategy and within that strategy he has his rules of what he's looking for to enter a trade you know both long side and short side and um and he has his rules for getting out and so it I think his approach could probably be systematized, but he does he does it on a discretionary basis. Gotcha. And and uh, Jeffrey Newman. So Jeffrey Newman, he grew so under five thousand dollars to now exponential over a hundred million or so. Um, yeah. Now he was a he, fifty million when I did the book. And fifty million. He's wow. Multiplied it a number of times since then. Wow. And so you did the book, it, it came out. So this is before the pandemic, he made 50 million. Yeah. 50 million. Okay. So and that was, you know, that took him, that took him from, I took him about 15 years or so. Um, and, uh, but since then he's, like I say, he's, he's made multiples of that in the last few, he's had his best years ever. Um, so, so, yeah. So, so with that, um, my question is, okay. So when, from your experience and your interview with him and your relationship with him. Um, so when he started with a small amount and then he grew it to, let's say over a million, you know, so when you grow in it from my experience and from like the traders that I interview that's, that are similar to me, we take a small amount and we grow it to a million. And I, I know somebody that's grown it to 10 million, maybe a little more, 20 million, 15 million. So like to take it to that extreme, like Jeffrey Newman, what, because like these milestones of half a million, one million, two million, they're just like huge psychological barriers on like what is even possible to a trader when you brought a small amount of money and increase increases successfully to those levels. Now, what do you think with Jeffrey Newman for him? It was different where he was able to even like go way beyond that, you know, um, you know what I mean? Well, you know, he started, you know, for, he started off with penny stock, so. Obviously, his strategy had to change, you know, over time. And uh, what what Newman was very good at, or is very good, I should say, or very good as an understatement, is is incredibly talented at, is identifying trends early. He just catches these things, which to him is obvious. Um, but you know, and I was speaking to him, and this is. Uh, this is not in the interview, uh, but I spoke to him since then, and I, I interviewed him since then. And some of his material, you know, the material will, you know, there'll be an updated version eventually, and it'll be in that book. Um, but so he tells us, he tells the story of like with COVID, right? Take something, you know, not too far ago. Um, he recalls going into, he goes into CVS, and he, he wants to get masks. I said, oh, we don't have any. <laughs> goes to Walgreens. Uh, well, you know, he might have them in a few months. You can check back every day. So he kind of, hey, you know, picks up on that and finds a mask maker that's in the U.S. And, and you know, this is like early days before it becomes, you know, just, and, and he invests in it and he makes like 10 times his money on that time. That's kind of a typical Newman trade. He he just sees these, the, the, this thing that's going to happen and he just gets into it very early. Uh, you know, and he doesn't stay in that long. You know, he usually gets in as this stratospheric move, and then it comes, you know, the things you end up sold way down. Or, like in the interview, talked about 3D printers and sort of when 3D printers were sort of coming on, you know, on the scene, he sort of bought, he always liked to rise out the products. He bought 3D printers from every manufacturer, he tried them out. But anyway, he ends up buying, you know, I pick, I forget which company, pick one of the companies, and then he had some investments in the other companies. But those he had stocks that went from like a buck to a hundred bucks, you know, and they ended up going all the way back down again. But by that time, he's he's long gone. So he's he's really good at not identifying things that will be, you know, not identifying the Amazons, you know. So, but identifying those short term fads, so to speak, or the short term trends that are going to happen, and getting on to them when when they're you know like a, a big thing. And that's why he got involved in crypto as well. So he, you know, he did, you know, make quite a bit on, on crypto when it was going through a manic stage, but he's not there when it's, you know, by the time it's, 
by the time Bitcoin is collapsing, he's not there anymore. Yeah, and that's what people have trouble with. They hold it long, like longer than they should. So Newman comes in with the mentality of of going for that stratospheric move and just getting yeah, he's out. He's looking for the initial breakout from the base, you know, on 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 a trend he, he expects to happen in the in me, imminent near term, and he rides it for that that you know that exponential type move, you know, assuming he's right, which he often is. And then when it starts to break down, he gets out. Yeah. And uh, so one, the one chapter or the one uh, story that I liked of his was the sponge tech story. So he sponge tech, he, from my understanding, he didn't really believe in the company or he doesn't care about that. He's looking at like, well, he actually, saw it. Yeah, sponge tech, yeah. Sponge tech was a, uh, it actually was like, what to say? It was a, it was a soap bar in a sponge, you know. That's yeah. what it was. And they, their claim to fame was they started advertising, uh, you know, like major sports events. You see sponge tech, you know, across the screen and that thing. But anyway, um, he picked up on that because he saw there was like a tremendous amount of insider buying all of a sudden, like 750,000 shares or a million shares, I forget what it was. And so he jumped on the bandwagon. And sponge tech ended up being, a, a, you know, a scam. Um, I mean, he didn't know that. I mean, he didn't know. He just basically, he saw the insiders buying. And uh, and then when he started seeing, like, you know, it was being advertised in sports, sporting events, and his friends were talking about it, and people were getting interested in it, you know, that's where he gets out, you know, that's or after, not long after that. So, uh, yeah, that's the, you know, and that that's the, uh, and he ends up getting out, in that particular, the interesting story there is he's on safari in Africa. Doesn't this is pre pre iPhone days, and actually has to go to the office. Yeah, he gets a he gets a message. He had he had a BlackBerry, and his friend you know bought Sponge Tech on his advice, and uh, you know kind of sends him a message you know about what it's doing and what did you do, and it has gone up a lot. So. He just wants to get out. So he you know, goes to the office and somehow after 15 minutes gets a connection and is able to dump all the shares. And literally like that day, the thing collapses or something. So uh... Incredible. Yeah. So he, he, he closed the position out on a safari in Africa with the Blackberry. Incredible. You know, what's funny yeah. also, Jack, I don't know if you remember. So there's a, a podcast that I follow and I've had them on my podcast too. Confessions of a Market Maker podcast, which has... One of the hosters, JJ, a former market maker, and he blacks his, his face out on the screen. But he was one of the market makers for Sponge Tech. And uh, I oh. think they, yeah, I don't know if you probably remember. So it's, it was a while back. Um, and yeah, he, they were technically like compensated or something. There was some real shady stuff going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like um, I say, it was, it, was a, it was a scam. You know, it ended up being a scam. You know, it was a scam. Yeah. So, um, Oh, they never paid for that sports, you know, broadcasting. They stiffed the company. They, so they stiffed the. They scammed the uh, uh, the tennis. Was it tennis? They, they stiffed the, uh, the, uh, the the venues. You know, they didn't pay their their bills for that either. You know, so yeah. So so with Jeffrey Newman, you mentioned that he, what was key for him in that trade was the insider buying. So is he like a fundamentals trade based? Uh, trader at least then or is he looking at like using his imagination about like where the future like let's say like for crypto for example or for 3d printing is he like a a, a wide uh big picture idea kind of guy together with fundamentals like what makes jeffrey newman newman jeffrey newman yeah it, it's just like the thing that makes let's take the last part of that question first the thing that makes him jeffrey newman is just this uncanny ability to spot trends right before they go just in his ordinary life, you know, and uh, that's he just picks up on these things. Like he has an antenna that just picks up these things. And I think it's a talent, um, he, you know. So he he's, he uses kind of a combination of fundamental and technical. Uh, his ideas strictly come from fundamental, but to get into the trade, he's looking for like usually these things are in a long term downtrend or in the basing or something. He's looking for a breakout, and he might try it a few times, you know. Uh, although his timing is usually tied to 
something happening in society that that is a, an indicator to him that it's ready to go. And the same thing with getting out. He's looking for to, you know, break, break, you know, this steep uptrend, these things that go tend to go in steep uptrends, and he's looking for it to break down from that. So, you know, his entry and exits are aided by by technical, but his ideas come are are fundamental and I would say observational. And um yeah, so that's best way I can put it. Gotcha. And okay, so now I'm going to take go back to the regular market wizards so that your your very beginning. So you you started with the, this futures book and you create the futures book. Is this after you worked at um at that firm and you met Mark Michael Marcus or? Yeah. That, yeah. Is, so, the, yeah. The, well, you know, Michael Marcus was trading a commodities corp. So but I knew Mike, I knew Michael Marcus, who, who, who was the first chapter of the first market wizards book. I knew him because he was vacating my first job on Walt, my first job period. My, my, I should say my first job, my first real job out of school, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I had jobs like waiter and stuff like that, but I mean, my first real job was as an analyst, futures analyst, and I was taking the place of uh, Michael Marcus, who was leaving to become, in quotes, a trader. And so he was cleaning out his desk, and I came to the first day. So we met, you know, he was leaving, I was coming in. And he was still in New York those first couple of years. We used to get together for lunches every, every few weeks. So I knew him that way. And then when he, he moved out to Malibu and, uh, you know, he was he was work managing money for this firm called Commodities Corp, which is a, a famous historical firm that hired some of the, you know, early futures traders and they made a lot, you know, it was one of the prop, first prop trading firms that was very successful. And so he managed, he was their best trader ever, and he managed their most money, the most money for them. Anyway, he moved out there, and when I decided to do Market Wizards, he was definitely on my, you know, list to, to interview, and that's, but I knew him. I also, he hired me to work, you know, within Commodities Corp as an analyst for him. So for about a year, I did that, and I was technically an employee, although I was never physically at their location, which was in Princeton, New Jersey. I was an employee of theirs as well, but I knew him before that point. Gotcha. And for okay, so Michael Marcus, he was the the first chapter, I believe, right? And yeah. the market was yeah. The first so, chapter in the first book. Gotcha. And then so what in, was interesting, uh, very one of the most interesting things about him to me was that he it took him a very long time to get good. He uh, he yeah. just kept coming back and he, yeah, he had this. Uh, and yeah, you, you mentioned that um a lot of these market wizards, they have like this really um they believe in themselves like to an extraordinary extent. So, like, yeah, can you go about explaining maybe a little bit about Michael Marcus and his confidence in himself to yeah. continue for i think it was 10 years of of, of you of know this. marcus had a kind of a litany of, of failures and in, in, you know all the you know, repeated failures and most people would have quit you know somewhere along the line you know one of those failures i mean um without going through all of them but he had some early failures and then started to get it together and uh and then so finally his first success was, but he wasn't there yet. He, he had uh, started following this letter, Chicago grain letter, and was talking about a corn blight. And so he started investing in corn and, and it was going up and up and he built this large position. And so he, he kind of, you know, made, I don't know how many multiples, but he, he built up this $3,000 account, I guess into 30,000 or something. So he thought he was on his way finally. And then there was a theory that the corn blight would 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 carry over, uh, would carry over to the next year. So he bought more. So he went into corn again, and he bought some wheat and as well. And he he margined himself fully. And then because he was using all his money, he borrowed money from his mother, twenty thousand dollars from his mother, who who was lower middle class. I mean, she didn't you know he came from a lower middle class background, and so that twenty thousand was like a lot of money for them. And what happened was, so he had like fifty thousand dollars invested. And one day, there's a story uh, in I don't know it was the Wall Street Journal or one of the financial papers, and the headline read, "More blight on the floor of the trade, you know, on the on the board of on the Chicago Board of Trade than in the fields of Iowa." 
something along that line. And uh, and the market just collapsed, you know, went limit down, limit down, limit down. And by the time he got out, he had wiped out again. And so he not only lost back the money he had made, he lost his mother's money as well. And um, of all his failures, I think that was the worst one, you know, because uh, before he was losing smaller amounts of money. And, uh, but he just kept at it. And he just, you know, I asked him, I mean, didn't you think about giving up? And he, he kind of used this analogy of like, fiddler on the roof, sort of like, almost like talking to God, like, am I really that dumb? And just, no, you could do it type of thing coming back to him. And he just believed in himself and uh, he eventually became enormously successful. Uh, so, we, which, which kind of, in my mind, provides two lessons. One is that early failure doesn't necessarily mean you will be a long-term failure. Uh, it doesn't mean you'll be a success either, but it does mean that Success and even incredible success is possible despite numerous early failures. And the second lesson is that one trait of the market resistance is that they're just incredibly persistent. You know, they 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 keep on coming back where most people would give up. So uh, anyway, those are two lessons I draw from from his story. And I I like to I put it as chapter one because I really like the story. It was it, you know, it, it was just filled of these experiences of, of obstacles and overcoming them uh, and just one after the other. It's kind of an incredible story that ultimately, you know, becoming very successful. Incredible. So, so with Michael Marcus, so um, he was trading futures and so he was a discretionary trader with futures. Cause like the first thing I think about with futures is it's probably a systematic or like a quant or some kind of algorithm is doing it these days. But in those days, maybe these days too, um, discretionary, you can have these those crazy ups and downs. And like with him, how was he going about it? Did he have like rules? Did he go by data? Like was he purely uh like what, you know, what he, was his Yeah, he he you know, I think if I get so he with the side there, there's he had like several elements that, that were critical for a trade. So there had to be like a fundamental idea about it to trade. Um, and, uh, then there had to be, you know, the chart had to be right, you know, set up for the trade. So there was a technical aspect to it. And then finally he wanted to see the market. The third element was he wanted to see the market responding to news in a correct way. Like if he was bullish, he wanted to see the market shrug off bearish news, uh, that type of thing. So those were the three elements he basically ideally looked for in a trade. And when he got those, he, he would go bigger. And he still did other trades because those type of situations didn't come up often enough to keep him, you know, fully engaged. But he admits that really all his money was made on the trades where those three things came together. So he was a combination of fundamental and technical, and um, it was not systematic in any way. Uh, and even today, I, I, you know, futures, uh, futures are really no different than any other market. I mean, basically, there's. Because there's futures of any, there's stock futures, there's bond futures, there's currency futures, you know, whatever type of futures there are, there is an underlying market, which is the same thing. The difference about futures is simply they can be traded on a margin. So you, you get a lot more leverage. And the concept of futures being risky is actually kind of misguided there. In apps, in terms of if you if you put all of the full value of a contract, you know, invested. Futures actually tend to be less volatile than than other markets. Uh, it's just the fact that you can do it on, on margin, and most people just don't take that into account fully. So they're putting up three percent margin, four percent margin, and they do too. They trade too much. So they trade too large. So futures can be very volatile because people. It's not because the underlying market is volatile. It's because people are just taking too much advantage of the fact. They can be margined by with such a small amount of money. So that's really where the volatility comes in. But otherwise, they're like any other market, and there is there is apt to be, you know, there there is there is um, well suited for systemization as any other market. It's no more, no less, because they really just represent the other markets. Gotcha. So so with that, um so I've listened to some recent podcasts you've done, and I think last time we touched on it too, and I think you mentioned it as well in the book, uh, about like 
traders, anybody can become a trader, but like, you know, just like anybody can become a violinist or a marathon runner, but just uh, to become like the elites, it's, it's uh, very few. So is that like, so Michael Marcus, so how did he see himself? Like, uh, because you, um, he traded for 10 years of, of failing for 10 years. So like he saw himself at an elite level, even though he was failing, failing, he, he, he believed in himself that he can get to that elite level because um, he got there. So, you know, just the same thing with, with the runners or the violinists, like anybody can do it, but like, what about getting to live, you know, work, playing at an orchestra or going for like um, uh, the Olympics or something, you know? So, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So, you know, I, you know, basically I think it's, un, you know, most people, you know, I think they could be, want to be spectacularly successful, which is fine as a desire and objective, but the reality is it's not going to be in the cards for most people. I, you know, there's, there's no reason to believe that trading is any different than anything else. I mean, most people are not going to, you know, if they're, if they if they play basketball, most people are not going to end up in the NBA. Right. And, uh, you know, if like if you know if they're if they're like say a violinist, they're not going to be end up end up playing first solo violin for the New York Philharmonic. You know, realistically, you know, only a very small percent in any profession are going to get that upper elite status. And and part of that is you know a lot of that is is hard work and commitment and everything else. But another part of it is just innate talent. You know, it's some people just have this. The innate skill to become a super sports star, but just desire and and commitment and all of that is not going to do it by itself. You still need the innate talent, and I think trading is somewhat the same. You know, <clears throat> Jeffrey Newman isn't didn't end up being Jeffrey. You know, his his success doesn't come just because he was committed to doing it. It it comes because he has this innate. It's the same for Marcus. You know, uh, I'll give you a, an example, and it like it, it just illustrates why. This idea that there's an innate uh, talent to it. Uh, like I say, Marcus and I used to have lunch together every few weeks or whatever. And I remember back, you know, this was back in 73, a long time ago. Yeah, you know, I was just new in the industry. And um, I, I was an analyst, in, you know, for futures. And one of the markets I followed was cotton. So, you know, having an economics degree, I kind of went back and I kind of analyzed every cotton market in the post World War II period. And, and all did all that stuff, you know, all that economic work and everything. And I kind of came, you know, what I found was basically that the cotton prices were most seasons were were just determined by the government loan program because that set a floor and that's where the price was. But I found there were like a few seasons where there was a free market, and it was one of those seasons that was like seventy three, and it wasn't a very bit. I knew it wasn't enough of a sample, but it was the only guideline to go. So based upon that, I reached my conclusions. I thought it was going to be a full market. We were at like 25 cents. I thought it would go like up to the mid thirties and that should be about it going on the prior season that was similar. And I remember, you know, so and the first part of that was right. We did get a bull market, we did go up, but I remember having lunch with, with Marcus and I would look like at all these things. And it was like, you know, if you look at a hundred different fundamentals, right? But Marcus kind of saw that 73 was the first year that the PRC, which was China, you know, all people's probably China, that's what China was called in those days. The PRC was a buyer of American cotton for the first, first time ever. And he, he saw that was a game changer. That was the key. So he saw that was just the key driving force and nothing else mattered. And so where I was expecting, I did all this work and I was expecting the market to maybe top out somewhere in the 30s. He kind of saw that this was going to keep on going just because that was a driver. And that ability to sort of pick out out of everything, to pick out the one thing that's important, or like Newman picks out the one trend that's about to break out. That's what I'm talking about. That's kind of the innate talent. And in that particular case, I didn't end up going to 99 cents, you know, <laughs> like triple the third, you know, the high of the of the previous the previous high. So um, yeah, so going back to your question, I think it's a combination. Yeah, you need the work, you need the commitment. You need all of that stuff. Um, and you need to develop a methodology. You need to have good risk management. But at the end of the day, you still have to have I, that. All that can get you to be a winning trader, but it won't get you to be a spectacular winning trader. You know, so um, to, to, for that, I think there is an element 
of some sort of element of, of talent that's involved. Excellent. Wow. Okay. So we had talked about innate talent and, and yeah, just to be a winning trader and a spectacular trader. So with that, I have a, a couple of thoughts. So, you know, everybody reads uh, market wizards or no market wizards hedge fund. We all dream of having this spectacular performance. We are all inspired by all these stories and all everything. Now I've noticed there's a lot of retail traders. They, every, a lot of people want to get involved now because it's easy to get involved. You get an app on your phone you can turn on, download stuff on the computer, fund an account easily. Now, everybody, I've noticed there's a lot of people, they want to to become profitable. They want to approach the systematic trading. And there's a lot of buzz about systematic training, finding your edge through systematic training, systematic trading. Now, when, but you know, if you're reading the market wizards and you're doing systematic trading, you want to eventually graduate to spectacular performance which is uh, a lot of, like the examples in the book, they're mostly discretion, uh, discretionary. So how does one like marry the two of systematic and discretionary uh, to achieve spectacular performance? Uh, well, first of all, there are very few of the, if you go through the market wizards book, you'll see that for the most part, they're mostly, mostly discretionary traders. Um, and, there are some spectacularly successful systematic traders. Um, well, I can think of somebody like Ed Thorpe, but it's not systematic in a way that people don't really think of it. So Ed Thorpe was a math, you know, a mathematician, and um, he kind of figured out all sorts of, uh, yeah, he, he figured out inefficiencies in the market and was able to take advantage of those. But um, yeah, whether it, you know, for options or, Verbal bonds. He came up with a lot of these strategies before they existed, but that's that's kind of a different type of systematic. Yes, it was systematic. It was all systematic, um, but it, it's not what people think of systematic. It was it was a math type of systematic. It was it was kind of in the same family as as Renaissance or De or these type of firms, where yes, they were these traders are not trading discretionary. They're trading systematic. But it's a, it's a lot of heavy duty mathematics and data going into it. And uh, Thorpe was a single PhD guy, but Jim, uh, but some of these other firms can have like a hundred PhDs uh, you know, working on this stuff. So that's that type of stuff. You know, those some of those uh, outfits have have or people have done exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. But that's this very specialized type of approach, and it does require a lot of quantitative skill and computer power. Um, the thing that people think of as systematic, though, is not that. It's it's really trying to come up with rules about the, the market and just you know put it down into a computer program and having the computer trade. And that type of approach, I think, is more limited. You, you can do well. Uh, I mean, I, I do have like in unknown market wizards, there is a systematic trader, Marston Parker, and he does, he's done well. I mean, he's done well. Uh, he's not done Jeffrey Newman well, but he's done well, but it's not the same level of uh, performance. There's a limit to what systematic trading can do. So in his case, kind of, he's he's gone along for like 20 years, making 20% plus returns without really, you know, a lot of many significant drawdowns. Um, so he, and he's earned a living as a trader. So it's worked uh, and he's done you know, well, but it's it's a different level than, than the, you know, turning, you know, 5,000 to, to, you know, uh, 200 million or whatever it might be. So, um, and the reason is um, the markets don't lend themselves to simple systems extracting stupendous return to risk. It just doesn't work that way. So yes, you can come up with systems that make money, but the risk is going to be significant relative to the return. And if you're really good, you know, your return will be greater than, than types of drawdowns you see, but still it won't be, it won't be the type of spectacular performance that people think of. So uh, I think there's a place for systematic, but um, and for many traders, it may be the best approach, uh, but it's it's very difficult to turn that into something that is extraordinary performance.
Got you. So you mentioned Ed Thorpe. Uh, and Ed Thorpe was in the original Market Wizards, and now he he's still in California. No, he wasn't, actually, he could have been. He could have been in the original Market Wizards. He could. He sort of be old enough to have been in there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he 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 wasn't. He was in Hedge Fund Market Wizards. Hedge Fund. Oh, he so was. I didn't, okay. interview, I didn't get around to interviewing him until that book. I had intended to interview him previously, just didn't work out for whatever reason, and I got around to the Hedge Fund Market Wizards. What what year did the hedge fund market wizards come out? Two thousand, I wrote it in two thousand twelve. I think it came out in thirteen. Thirteen, and, and when did he defeat Vegas, or did all that stuff? Oh, in Vegas? So they, they, yeah. So his his original thing uh, was beating the casinos, and that was back in that was back in the sixties. That was back in the sixties. So like those old mob movies you see, and uh, you know. And ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that was the old Vegas days, and uh, when he came up with ways to, to beat the casinos at blackjack and and even and roulette for that matter, and uh, and baccarat, and you know, wow, he, uh, yeah, I thought it was only uh, blackjack or poker, I didn't know it was baccarat. No, well, blackjack that... was the same, was the one that's best known because then he wrote his book, Beat the Dealer. Which became a bestseller, and which a lot of people read, which changed the way casinos operate. By the way, and you know, because they—that's when they went to the, the multiple decks and reshuffling. All that came came because of beat the dealer. Um, so yeah, so that was his most—he's most famous for that because that book, that book really changed a lot of things and made people aware that it was possible to beat the casinos. Um, Without cheating, <laughs> and uh, but so that was the famous card counting thing and all that. It, it actually has the reason I I actually include that in that interview with him not only because well not only because it's an interesting story and there's there's stuff that could be a movie in there like there's an attempt on his life you know his car his car is fixed and he doesn't have the brakes going down the winding road and all of that but beyond it being a good story uh, it actually had a relevance to to trading and. The point I make out of it is that he had this brilliant insight that you could turn what is a losing game into a winning game um, by simply varying the size of the bet. So in terms of blackjack, if you if you always bet the same amount, you're going to lose, no matter how good you are. You can make the best, you can make the theoretically correct bet all the time, but you're going to lose over time. You're just guaranteed. If, however, you, you know, your cards could be counted. You wanted to have the resh frequent reshuffling on that. And you kept track. And then when a, when a lot of, uh, uh, you know, when there weren't many pictures uh, pictures and aces out, you bet heavier, you know, and and when there were, you know, more, you bet, la you know, less. If you vary the size of the bet by based upon what's left in the deck, um, then you could turn what was a, negative edge into a positive edge. He mathematically proved that. And uh with that realization, that's 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 what led, you know, that's that's how he, he was able to be also the, the lesson for traders is that many traders have more than one type of trade. And certain trades there's a there's a more higher confidence than other trades. And the lesson is if you kind of bet heavier on the trades that have a better that your experience tells you have a better probability of success than the other trades. You even if you don't have an edge overall, just doing that can take you into a, a winning edge just by varying the size of the bet. So that's the lesson that applies to trading. Gotcha. And so having bigger bets on, uh, on a higher probability setups, and 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 yes. Thorpe came up with the Kelly criterion. I have the book. I, I haven't read it. It's too. I didn't he didn't realize come up with it. He, he used it. You know he, he, that separately. Actually, he used it. The you know, the Kelly guy he used it for blackjack, and uh, but you can't use it, and you can use it in a blackjack because and the Kelly guy trade for people who don't know is the mathematical answer to how do you maximize your return? You know, what amount of money should you bet each time to maximize your return and uh, over time? And it, it actually is a very aggressive type of betting strategy. It depends on different things. Uh, it depends on your being able to continually 
reduce the size of the bet, you know, to proportionately. If you're losing, at some point you're taking very, very small bets, you know, smaller than maybe possible in, in real markets. Well, yeah, I guess in real markets you could trade single shares and stuff. But the the the, the main problem with the Kelly criterion applied to markets is not that. It's the fact that in blackjack you know the exact probabilities. You you know you know to the whatever decimal point you want what the probability is for any you know anything uh, because you know it's is strictly it's strictly dict the outcomes are strictly dictated by probability. Uh, it's always the same in markets. It's different. You don't know. You can calculate what your probability of gain is on a certain strategy. But that doesn't tell you it's going to be that probability in the future. It's the best indication you can get, but it's not the same thing. So you uh, you can't really, if you apply the Kelly criterion in, in trading, you'll go broke because it has you betting much too aggressively. And Thorpe did not really, he never applied the Kelly criterion to anything other than, than you know, games of chance where the laws of probability were exa exactly defined what the, what, what the chance, what, what the probabilities were for every event. But in trading, that's not the case. They never did it for that. In trading, if he used it, he would use it like some fraction of the Kelly criteria. Gotcha. Okay, so with that, um, so what comes to mind at first, so in I, I've seen in, in the 90s, there's a movie that came out, Casino, or Robert De Niro. I'm imagining like, you know, uh, Ed Thorpe is one of those guys that De Niro kicks out for counting cards and having some kind of system that, that beat this, the, the casino. And um, so it tells me, so I know about Ed Thorpe. He, he was a professor at UCLA. He has a degree in physics and math, all this stuff. He's a yeah. genius. Now, like at the same time, he kept going back to these casinos after he got kicked out. And then like he was able to transfer to the, to the stock, uh, change to the stock market later on, even though he has like a, uh, a low, uh, let's say a, a 50% strategy or less maybe, but it's, as long as the, the bets go at the right place, he's able to continue winning. And he has this book of the Kelly criteria, all this math equations. And like now you know, he went to be extremely successful. Um, you know, I just, I'm just trying to understand what kind of person was Ed Thorpe? Like how did he exude confidence because of his, his, his genius, I guess that he, was he aware of like uh, of his, of his intelligence, you know, and and to keep coming back to the casinos after getting kicked out and getting your life threatened, you know. So it's 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 like it takes a certain person uh to be to be like that. So like, what was your and you mentioned yeah. in the last podcast we did that he was your, your favorite guy to hang out with and stuff. So <laughs> I wanted well, he, to. He, yeah, he he gave up the casinos pretty quickly. I mean, because when he realized, you know, first of all, the danger element of it, um, and. Um, you know, if, and what he knows, they, they had discussions of what to do with, with this math professor, you know, playing the casino uh, themselves. Um, but they decided just not to do, you know, it was worth, you know, the publicity would be, would, would be too negative. Um, but, it, you know, so he, he, he just realized that that was not a long-term prospect. And he realized that there was these markets there and that was a much bigger game and nobody could kick him out of it. And... Uh, he just, when he set upon to analyze it, he figured out these inefficiencies that existed. Uh, some of his early inefficiency that he figured out was that, you know, warrants were mispriced. You know, this is, he figured out, you know, every, everybody knows now the black shells model, but he basically mathematically derived the equivalent of the black shells model years before that famous paper was published, which eventually won the Nobel Prize. And um, so for years, he's kind of printing money, trading warrants, uh, because they're just horrendously mispriced. And he's kind of one guy in the world who knows this, you know. So, yeah, he had tremendous confidence, not, be, you know, confidence was based on math. He kind of knew, you know, he knew the number, he knew the numbers, he knew what this implied. And uh, all this trading, you know, when, when he figured out the, the convertible, you know, bonds were, were mispriced because they had optionality and so forth. Without getting into the math of this whole thing, but he he under, he he understood all these things. So he had tremendous confidence because he this inefficiency existed, and it's it's sort of like um, nothing is as simple as as arbitrage, you know, in classic arbitrage. How they ever exist for very long, but if you could buy, I mean, if you were able to buy gold. You know, gold at at uh, at uh, I don't know, 
using round numbers at some past time at 500 in one place and sell it, you know, and buying a 500 and selling 502 in another place. And you could always do it. Well, it's a guaranteed profit. Well, the strategies he was coming out, coming, of course, that doesn't exist because arbitrageurs will bring the two markets together. But he was coming up with that type of inefficiency was more hidden in the market prices. And he would figure out a way to exploit it. And so he had that tremendous confidence because he knew the numbers. He knew that these things were mispriced and that it was almost a can't lose proposition, all these strategies he was coming up with. Now, over time, other people would, would come would come on to it and, and eventually the edge would go away. But he was early on and that's how he was able to figure it. So yeah, he had the confidence that came out of this strong knowledge that he knew there was this mispricing and you know, like I say, it was almost, he doesn't, he didn't use the word can't lose, but the types of trades he was doing were kind of those type of trades. Gotcha. So you mentioned uh, he would do work on something and when it became popular, it stopped working. So with that, um, like, uh, was he able to adapt and find another strategy and just do, yeah. uh, you know, like how easy does it come to these market wizards to, to be able to adapt? Like, okay, one thing doesn't work. They're not a one hit wonder. They're able to re to, do another version of you adapt and find something else. So what kind of quality do you think that that is and do it, do it just as well or better? So what kind of like, not everybody has that quality. A lot of times I know, for example, the past couple of years, someone's uh, su succeeded in 2021, made a ton of money. And in 2022, they're like, they're uh not doing so well. So, yeah. um, yeah, so like, what are your thoughts with that? Like, with the market wizards and Ed Thorpe? Well, it, it, that, that ties into the characteristic of, of flexibility, which I always point out as an important trait. And so, the ability to to recognize that you're wrong, or or your strategy is no longer working, or so this this the, that is a key element. Uh, that the ability to to change what you're doing as dictated by the market. Uh, is is an important part of of survival, even you know, in, in terms of it being being a trader, right? So, like you mentioned, 21, 22, So, somebody starts, you know, uh, doing stuff like buying stocks like GameStop, GameStop, and and the Bed Bath Beyond, because they catch on to this, you know, thing that's going on, and that's their first experience. Yeah, and they keep on doing that, and everything works. But it's not not only those stocks go, you know, crash eventually. But that whole thing just goes away. It's it's a momentary thing, uh, and if you don't recognize, if you don't have the ability to change what you're doing and to recognize what you're doing no longer works, um, you know you're you're just not going to make it. Yeah. Um, so, also, I wanted to ask. Um, so with the market wizards, so a lot of them started like with retail or a small amount of money. We talked about Jeffrey Newman. Ed Thorpe was a similar situation. He was uh, started retail trading on his own. Uh, Michael Marcus is, was a trader, but then they they go to manage money at funds uh, and become exponentially, you know, the hundreds of millions, fifty million plus. So when they're trading their own money, is there or traders or market wizards that trade their own money? Is there like a, a general? I don't want to say ceiling because there really is no ceiling, but like a certain level where, you know, you stop growing exponentially with your own money that now you need to take on a fund or start a fund to get the same exponential result to go to of hundreds of millions. Well, it depends on the trader and somebody, you know, in Newman's case, he never managed money. He's always been managing. His own ah, money. Okay. Uh, so it really depends. And Marcus, Marcus was managing money, but he also managed his own money. Uh, it, it really depends on the trader. Uh, and so some traders just continue to trade their their own money, and some uh, in most cases, if they're trading large, they are trading institutional money. So Newman is more the exception in that case. Uh, so yeah, so in most cases, the people are they are managing in other other funds. I mean, their fund may be invested as well, but but they are managing other money. So. Um, you know, that's the more typical case. So you think of, you know, people like you know, some of the early wizards like uh, Bruce Kovner and Stanley Druckenmiller and Paul Tudor Jones and, 
you know, all these, all these, you know, most famous guys, they were hedge fund, they were managing institutional money. They, they didn't, that's more the exception to just start off your own money, build it up and end up managing hundreds of millions of your own money. That's really the, like I say, it's the exception. Gotcha. And uh, with the hedge fund market wizards, um, what what's the main quality you see at, between the hedge fund market wizards and the market wizards? Because they're they're coming from different places. What they're managing money as opposed to uh, the hedge, the market was just all types of people. Well, in, in market the original market market wizards, in most most of the people were managing money even in those books. So um, there was a combination of people who traded their own accounts and people who managed money. But it was I think there were more that managed money even in those you know first two. Market Wizards books. So Hedge Fund Market Wizards wasn't so different. Then the only difference was that, with one exception, uh, they were all they were all funds. They were all you know they were all managing funds. But it was one. I had one prop trader in there. Uh, that was an exception because I just liked the story. Um, but he still was managing money. Gotcha. And Jack, to start to wrap it up, so. Um, any any new books coming out, or what are your plans for the future as far as the market wizards concerned? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I, I don't actually have you know I I should say that I've never really had any plan to make it. You know, when I finish one book, I the never book the next book was never planned. Uh, even the book the closest might be market wizards, and it wasn't that it was planned initially, but it was so successful, and I had traders left over that I didn't use in the first market wizards book. So maybe in that case, the second, the, which was called New Market Wizard, which came only three years later, in that case, that was somewhat, you know, maybe anticipated, not at the time of the road market wizards, but certainly after it had been successful in the first year or two, I started, you know, uh, thinking about seriously doing the sequel. Uh, but other than that, every book that I've done has sort of just come along and I've kind of decided to do it. Uh, it, was, it was never planned. I never knew there would be... Uh, if you ask me after the second market wizards book was supposed to be another one, I said I don't think so. You know, but it, there were you know there were several others, but they were planned. So I have no plans right now to do another uh, you know another market wizards book or any other book. I've done other books as well, but I've written what I wanted to write, and I don't really have any desire to, to do another book or or any compelling concept for a book. That I that I want to do, so I'm only to kind of just go with what I have, and if I get the inspiration to do something, it'll it's not there now. Maybe it'll come to future. I never say never because I I never plan to write. I think I've done twelve books at this point. I never tended to write that many. Uh, it just happened, and I won't rule out that I'll ever do another one. But I'm not planning to do one, and and I am now getting you know, older uh, in the sense that. You know, I want to take advantage of the years I have and don't want to necessarily work full days anymore. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm not planning. Gotcha. And uh, so with the Market Wizards, I know uh, I saw an interview you did uh, on, on, on YouTube somewhere that you mentioned Jesse Livermore, which he has that famous quote, the markets change, but people or uh, the people change, but human nature never changes. So yeah. were you aware of that quote? How, like, how, from the very beginning, because like with the market wizards, it's like a timeless thing. It's like all these different uh, market wizards and they all trade differently, but like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's still like a classic. It's a timeless classic. The lessons still apply over and over after so many decades or how long has it been since, you know, so did you have that? It like, I've, did that occur to you um, in the beginning? Like you're making a timeless book. <laughs> yeah, actually it's funny you say that because it did. Um, and it, it, it sounds egotistical to say it, but it, it wasn't so much ego, it was a matter of objective. So I had read the original, I had read reminiscences, uh, you know, when I was young, and uh, it was about 65 years after it came out. And I was struck by how relevant it still was. And uh, so when I wrote Market Wizards, which is in a completely different style and format and all of that, but I did have in mind that I was wanted to do something that just like I was reading 
you know, reminiscences 65 years later, and it was still relevant, I, I did have the objective of trying to do a book that would be, you know, some sense timeless, that would, would be around <laughs> 65 years later. And, um, you know, at this point, uh, the first Mark of Wizards book, it's over 30 years, so, and it, uh, it's still going, you know, strong for that type of, you know, given how old it is. Uh, so, yeah, so that was my objective. Right? And I did have that paragon in my mind of, of reminiscences. And, uh, yeah, so that was something that I was had in mind when I was doing it. That was one of my objectives in writing the book. Awesome. All right, Jack. Well, thanks so much for taking the time out to come on the podcast. You know, your books are our inspiration to all of us retail traders. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough. It's it's just been an honor to have you on once again, you know, legendary author. Uh, you know, it's it's incredible. But yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. And yeah, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Thank you, David. Thanks, Jack. Bye.